The U.S. Open is happening, and we will hear from golfer turns commentator Smiley Kaufman on the ins and outs of that tournament. Plus, Formula E has been bought, the Big 12 is exploring a game-changing deal, and things are weirder than usual in the world of competitive eating. It's Friday, June 14th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. car racing series Formula E has been bought by Liberty Global. The telecom company bought out the shares owned by Warner Bros. Discovery to give it 65% ownership, making it the new majority owner. Formula E is separate from Formula One, but they are both governed by the FIA, and Liberty Global is separate from F1 owner Liberty Media, but they are both chaired by John Malone. Liberty Media also recently bought the motorcycle racing series MotoGP. Remains to be seen whether these corporate relationships will help Formula E and MotoGP pick up some of F1's tailwinds. The Big 12 is exploring the idea of selling its conference naming rights in what could be one of the biggest deals ever for a college conference other than media contracts. If a deal does come to pass, the sponsor's name would replace the word big in the conference's name. The Big 12 is also in talks with private equity firm CVC Capital Partners on a stake sale of 15 to 20 percent, according to ESPN. That could bring in up to $1 billion in cash, though some presidents of Big 12 schools are skeptical that this is a good idea in the long run. The Atlanta Falcons and Philadelphia Eagles avoided any harsh penalties connected with the NFL's tampering investigations. The Falcons will lose their 2025 fifth-round draft pick and be fined $250,000 for improper contact with quarterback Kirk Cousins, wide receiver Darnell Mooney, and tight end Charlie Werner prior to those three being official unrestricted free agents. The Eagles avoided any penalty connected to their signing of running back Saquon Barkley. And finally, if you know the names of exactly two competitive eaters, they are likely Joey Chestnut and Takeru Kobayashi. Both became superstars at the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest, and neither will be participating in the upcoming contest on July 4th. Chestnut was barred from the tournament after accepting a sponsorship deal with Impossible Foods, which makes plant-based dogs and burgers. Nathan's requires exclusivity for its participants. Chestnut was paid $200,000 to participate in last year's tournament and says he was offered a four-year deal that would pay $300,000 per year on average to keep at it. Instead, he will face off against Kobayashi in a live Netflix special. The leading streamer was able to bring Kobayashi out of retirement to make that happen. Nathan's is left without its two biggest stars, but hey, they saw a deal they like better, and it's a dog-eat-dog world. Okay, we are pleased to be joined by Smiley Kaufman, a former PGA Tour pro who is now thriving as an on-course reporter for NBC Sports the network that has complete coverage of the U.S. Open from the iconic Pinehurst Number no. 2 in North Carolina. Smiley, thanks for being here. How are you doing? Hey, what's happening? Thanks for having me. Uh, look forward to talking about uh, this U.S. Open Championship. It's an, uh, an iconic venue here at Pinehurst Number no. 2. Uh, definitely excited to get the week started. Yeah, absolutely. So I think you're in a compound TV truck somewhere there in Pinehurst right now, and I know you played – in the most recent U.S. Open there in 2014. Miley, what are your memories of the course and fan atmosphere from that week, and, and how is everything comparing so far this year? Well, I guess for me, it's kind of unique in that it was my first start as a professional. So I had made it through local and sectional qualifying, uh, qualifying for Pinehurst in 14. And so I get out here Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so excited to play with, you know, Brant Senek or all these players that, you know, I've, I've watched on TV. And so for me, it was, first off, it was really cool to stack up my game against uh, the best in the world. So there's plenty of players just like me that are coming out of college and are in college that have an opportunity to play, you know, against Scotty Scheffler and, and, and hit next to him on the range and play with him in practice rounds. So that experience in itself was, I think, probably one that I'll credit to getting off to such a fast start in my professional career because I was like, you know what, I, I can beat that guy. Um, my, my game's good enough. So I think... Uh, that was one of my memories. The second is, let's talk about the golf course in Pinehurst. Back in 14, they were bent greens, and I was really excited to putt on them. And they were just, you just, you, you can't believe how scary it really is around these greens to get up and down. Um, somebody that I feel like has always had a really good short game. Uh, you know, I never really struggled in scrambling statistic. But on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in 14, I was could not figure out what I wanted to do around these greens uh, because there aren't too many options. I think that's the beauty in this Donald Ross design is that there's not one way to do it. We saw Martin Keimer use a putter pretty much everywhere back in 14 with a ton of success, winning by eight shots. And 
I think I tried a different club every single day and never really figured out what to do. I've been out there this week, same guys, just testing to see, you know, can I use wedges? What is it a five iron? Is it a is it a three wood or is it a putter? Um, I think that's the beauty of it is all the different options that you have, and uh, somebody's gonna figure it out, and some guys won't. I did get to play number two last month for the U.S. Open Media Day, and I will say I. I don't think I have the greens figured out, so I, I have no more advice to give to anybody else looking for anything there. But um, Smiley, for, for people who, who may not be everyday golf fans, can you just share a little bit about your journey from leaving the PGA Tour and getting to where you are now as a, as a golf broadcaster? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I, I, I didn't ever see myself joining media. I was always a, a golfer, even when I was struggling playing golf. This was never something I considered doing. Um, it was a bug that was kind of put in my ear a couple of years ago that, uh, they're like, Hey, you know, you'd, you'd be pretty good at TV. And I'm like, I don't know about all that. You know, I, I'm no, I don't know if I'm a TV guy, you know, just not knowing what you don't know. And I was given an opportunity to do, uh, the, the PJ championship at Southern Hills a couple of years ago. And immediately I realized like, wow, I'm having a lot of fun with this. Uh, it comes very natural to me. I'm basically just talking golf. Uh, which is what I love to do. And I uh, was able to do the U.S. Open with NBC and Peacock at the Country Club. Uh, had a great experience there as well. And at that point, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go all in with it. I'm just going to to uh, I'm just gonna try to pursue this as a, a career for the short term. And if I like it, maybe it turns into a long-term deal. Um, and after, I guess this would be three years later now, uh, I've quickly figured out that this is something that I want to do for a long time. Uh, I love doing it. I love, uh, you know, just golf in general, being able to do this for a living is it's very rewarding. It's something that I feel blessed to do, to be able to work with such an amazing team at NBC and all the talent, great talent that we have here on air and, and uh, amazing producers in the trucks as well that, uh, that help make the broadcast thing. So, for me, it's, it's been uh, a lot of fun, uh, definitely a learning uh, experience as, as I've gone. You know, there's been a lot of things as an on-course walker that I've had to pick up on, but um, luckily I've, I've gotten to learn from some of the best. So it's been a, it's been a, a fun and a uh, great start so far. Right, yeah. So you're typically an on-course reporter, but you've also been doing something this year called Fridays with Smiley Happy Hour during some second round afternoon coverage at tournaments the NBC has. Um, there's somebody tuning in this week for the first time just watching the U.S. Open. What can they expect on, on Friday afternoon when we get that uh, happy hour segment? Well, I think it's just a little different. You know, it's it's not typical golf, you know, coverage. It's, you know, you're, we're, we're leaning on the players. And that was kind of an emphasis from our, our main man at executive, Sam Flood, this year uh, heading into the year, which is, hey, we, we want to utilize the players as much as possible. Um, try to lean on them for information, try to get them involved in the broadcast. And we kind of played around with some different ideas at the beginning of the year. I ended up doing something uh, at the time before it was happy hour with Kevin Kisner at Phoenix. And that's where I think it kind of light bulb went off for Sam and, and as well as the rest of the guys in the truck that we need to continue to do this. We'll do it on Fridays. You know, we're not to the weekend yet, so we're not taking away from the drama that is, um, you know, we don't want to take away from any drama from the golf. We want to cover the golf, but we also want to have the players that have already played the golf course be able to come in, uh, sit down for 15 minutes, be able to look at uh, their highlights and also like just call golf as it goes around the golf course. So it it adds a, a different voice, but a voice that you can't argue with. It's one that just played the golf course and uh, whether they're in the lead or, you know, have some work to do on the weekend, you know, I, I've, I feel like my relationship with these players, I'm able to kind of know what they're thinking, kind of how, how they like to play the golf course and just try to send them in the right direction as far as the questions that I ask to where they can, uh, you know, be able to just talk golf and not have just like a normal Q and A like they have in so many different press conferences and, and uh, media settings. So I'm very, very blessed opportunity because I've definitely uh, had a lot of fun with it and I think the players have had fun with it too though. Yeah it's kind of just another evolution in golf media we have uh, the walk and talks with players walking and talking with the broadcasters you know from a whole then we have 
this, the happy hour and players coming in, like you said, after they played earlier in the day. Um, I know it sounds like it's been a lot of fun so far this year, but how do you think the energy will change at Pinehurst, considering this is a major championship, not just a, a weekly PGA Tour event? Yeah, it's a great question and one that uh, we're excited to try out. You know, we, we had some success at the 17th hole at the Players' Championship, and uh, the USGA is all on board. So they're, they're in for trying to innovate the coverage. And I think the key word here is access. I think all fans want to know players a little bit better and what they're thinking and how they can improve their game. And I think if, if you listen, listen closely enough, you're going to be able to hear some insight from these guys that you would never hear in a press conference. You would never hear after an interview. These, these guys have the opportunity to tell you exactly what they're trying to do on the golf course. And what it's helped us do as well is be able to listen to these guys and whatever they say, we, we are able to implement that on Saturday and, and on Sunday in our coverage from, you know, we just heard it from, from the bird's mouth as far as, you know, what exactly these guys are facing. So uh, it, it helps us from a broadcast uh, perspective to not just be guessing it's because we just had a guy come in here and tell us exactly what's going on. So uh, we're excited to see how it goes this week for the uh, US Open for sure. Hole number 15 where you'll be stationed uh, for the happy hour. Uh, it's a pretty rowdy scene uh, if I remember when I, when I was there last month. Um, it wasn't rowdy then, but there's a lot of hospitality build out. And I think the USG might, USGA might be expecting some fireworks. Um, what do you think we might get there as far as the action on the course and the fans interacting with the players? Yeah, you're going to see, uh, you're going to see some others and you're going to see some birdies. Uh, pars will be hard to come by. Bogies will be often. And I think that hole is just so difficult because of the challenge of the group. Everything, uh, I think you're going to hear every version of upside down cereal bowl, saucer, all these different ways to describe that the golf ball is just not going to stay on the green unless you're towards the middle. And when, when you're putting seven, six, and five irons in players' hands, it means the, the dispersion for those clubs just don't match how small the screen actually plays. So you can end up in a place that you think is a good leave and you don't execute the shot. And next thing you know, you're, you're in an even worse spot. So uh, it's, it's a mental challenge of how Donald Ross makes you commit to the shot. And if you don't, and you don't pull it off, you're going to have to hit it again, uh, which is kind of the, the beauty in which Pete Dye uh, has always designed his golf course. It's to intimidate the golfer. And Donald Ross, like how he's made this place play around the greens. And, you know, they're very lucky that they're in the sand area. So it can play very, very firm as opposed to clay underneath the ground. It's just, it's scary, especially with the forecast coming up that there's no rain in the forecast as of right now. That means this place will continue to get baked and baked out to where it's going to be harder and harder every single day. Yeah, 100%. So when we're talking about your career as a golf broadcaster, I'm curious now that you're a couple years into it, Smiley, do you have a long-term goal for what you want to accomplish? I mean, is working toward a lead analyst or something more prominent than a course reporter or something you're interested in long-term? You know, it's a great question. I, I love trying every role and whatever it is, I just feel like it helps me understand the broadcast a little bit better in every different role that I do. Um, times that I've been in the booth, I've absolutely loved it. Uh, but what it's also allowed me to do too is to listen to the on-course analyst to be able to realize uh, exactly how to make my craft better on the course. So, Having different perspectives and different roles, I think, has helped me. And then the challenge, too, of being in the happy hour role, I've kind of had to be a play-by-play -play guy, an analyst, um, and a holes guy, which is a lot to do, um, you know, with, with uh, trying to cover the golf and having a conversation and listening to what's in my ear. Uh, it's been a work in progress and a challenge, and sometimes um, I'll go back and watch the coverage to see how I can uh, continue to be better and be my own critic because – you know, I, I think only a, there's only a certain amount of people that will really tell you how, how it's really going. And so I lean on those people to give me good advice to see how I can, can continue to improve. But um, to your original question, I mean, I'm happy with wherever they want to have me. I just want to be calling uh, golf at the highest level. And wherever that is, I'll be happy. Uh, as of right now, I couldn't be more excited to be on the course this week. I feel like it's, you know, at my age, I feel like I still have great relationships with these players feel comfortable talking to them during the round. 
So it fits kind of where I'm at in my age uh, as of right now, but definitely love doing stuff in the booth as well. Um, so definitely look forward to potentially doing some more of that down the road. Yeah, definitely. And speaking of those relationships that you have with some of these players, you're obviously very plugged in. As far as when we look at the, the state of professional golf, uh, PGA Tour, Live, et cetera, what, what are you hearing about what players want to happen now? Is there, do you feel there's still a substantial divide or is it kind of just out of sight, out of mind? Well, I would say that the best thing about when we get the major championships is that all that talk goes away. That it's like the, it's like four weeks of the year that we don't have to worry about the live golf. We don't have to worry about PGA Tour, how the pro golf tour is going to come back together. So honestly, there's not a whole lot of talk in major weeks. These guys are so focused on, on trying to peak during, you know, it's, it's so difficult to win a major and, and to be peaking for one, it's very difficult to do. And sometimes you don't have your best stuff. Sometimes your body's hurting and other times the golf course just doesn't fit your eye. So these players are, are more concerned about that right now. But um, I would say that it's, it's hard to really know. I think for the longest time, we just kept, keep on hearing there's no progress. Then there is progress. And I think it's been exhausting uh, to cover it uh, from my perspective because the amount of information that even the closest people connect and get, uh, it's not a lot. And I don't think anybody really has a great answer, but I think Rory had some pretty good quotes last week along with Webb Simpson talking about how they felt like there was actually some great progress in their meetings last week in New York where Tiger Woods flew to meet with Piff and they had uh, some top level PGA Tour execs as well involved with uh, the meetings. And listen, I, I think we'd all love to, to have everybody back together, but it's going to be a very difficult process to get all this all this conformed back into one. I know I'd love to see it. The golfer would like to see it. I think everybody's just kind of tired of uh, kind of dealing with it, really. Okay, well, there we go. It's going to be uh, exciting to watch play out no matter what. Smiley, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. No, absolutely. Anytime. That's it for today. Hope you get some time outside this weekend. If you're enjoying the show and you have a moment, please give us a shout on social media or like and subscribe wherever you tune in. Thanks for listening. We will see you on Monday.